My name's Tommy George. I was Amanda Self's dad. Amanda was born to her mother and me June the 15th, 1982. Amanda was daddy's girl and Amanda loved to fish. And as she got older, she loved to hunt. And she hunted squirrels and rabbit with me, but her husband, Josh, and her in started going fishing and hunting together. And <clears throat> Josh and Amanda's real good friend, Brooks and Ashley Luckadoo, they clean deer and all that. And Amanda and Josh learned how to clean deer. Amanda, my daughter, she could take that deer, shoot it, skin it, Good it, took it. She was outdoor type person. <clears throat> she always wanted to play volleyball, baseball, softball. Amanda loved her sports. <clears throat> she always was very competitive. Amanda was into baseball and all with her kids. I don't want to go. I don't want to go. She always wanted to be a vet, but neighbor down the street. She had cats and all. Amanda went in there one day, and when she was sitting there, I walked in. Kathy and Amanda was there, and when I walked in, she looked like Mickey Mouse. Her face was so swollen. And she always wanted to be a vet, but that knocked it out. And from that day on, she always wanted to be a nurse. She went to uh, Greensboro for one year, and she was homesick. And she come back and went to Gaston College. She went to Gaston College for three years. And she made ER. ER nurse, and she worked there for a couple of years in the first infant that she lost as being a nurse. She come home and crying. And that was the only story she ever really told me about the ER. And an infant had died on her that day. And her charge nurse had crawled all over her because she was crying. And the doctor stood up for her and said, Get it, leave her alone, let her cry. It's the first baby that she that she's ever lost. <clears throat> a couple years later, she made charge nurse. She was over the ER. She had 30 employees that worked on her. And Amanda was a heck of a worker, and she was a hard worker. And she ran that ER like it was supposed to be ran. And the policemen, even the, even the doctors, have always told me, that girl stood up. She knew how to run that ER. She knew how to run it. And... Her catchphrase, whenever they did the uh, eulogy at her funeral, was, we got this, let's go. That was always Amanda saying in ER, we got this, let's go. And she was uh, in nursing, I guess, 13, 15 years, somewhere along there. She went in nursing in 2005, she passed away in 2018. 13 years and she made the ER charge nurse before then but in 2012 her mother was diagnosed with Pick's disease it's an aggressive form of dementia it's at the frontal lobe and <clears throat> the lifespan for Kathy would have been maybe 6 to 8 years and she was 58 and I was 55. Kathy was three years older than me. And I was praying that she wouldn't make it until I was 62. And she made it until I was 59. And I'd been freightliner for 32 years. But whenever I saw that her mother could not drive and I was afraid that she would kill herself or kill somebody else. I went on Thursday 
June the 29th, and I told the union there to get my stuff ready. I went back June the 30th, 2016, and that was Kendall's birthday. I'll never forget that, but I left then. I was 59, and I went from an $85,000 a year job to Fourteen hundred a month. I wasn't old enough yet, and I had a pension. wasn't old enough for Social Security. And after insurance, taxes, and all that, I brought on eleven hundred dollars a month. And I cared and made enough sacrifices for my wife. She was so good to me. I was not going to put her in home, and I loved her so much. I was not going to put her in home, but it was easy living on eleven hundred dollars a month. It was so simple and. Kathy, probably about, well, after I retired, she was almost at the stage that she couldn't chew or swallow. And she was a kid. She turned into a kid. She had diapers and things like that. And I had never done any kind of caring for people. I mean, it's just, I, I learned on the fly. And about a month, month and a half ever so often, Amanda would take and watch her mom for me. She was her caregiver, too, just to give me a break because it, it was just so stressful. But you learn on the fly, but it, it, always, it was a pleasure to watch my daughter. I'd do it. I mean, my wife, I'd do it again. And uh, <clears throat> Amanda would... She worked so such long hours. That's what amazed me about. She'd work such long hours and work all day. And she'd come home clean the house, or she loved to cook, and she loved her kids. She was so involved with Kendall and Caleb. And just Caleb was in the coach pitch. Kendall was in volleyball and softball both. And it seemed like every day one of them would be playing a game, and we'd always run, but. Kathy and me, we watched Kendall and Kay for a long time. They they would stay at the house probably at least every other weekend. They loved doing that. But the last time I talked to Amanda was at church on that Sunday, May the 20th, 2018. I always greeted at the church, and that I always greeted at nine thirty. Went to men's Bible study, and greeted at eleven o'clock, and then went eleven o'clock service. And whenever Amanda would come in, she would take her mom. Her mom would stand there with me because she'd take her in and keep her with her while she was in service, and let me do everything outside. <clears throat> but I remember that morning, Kate came in. I said, hey, girl, where you been? I ain't seen you in three weeks. And she said that they was going to go eat at Surf and Turf. And, uh, I think uh, Officer Lomick was on duty that day. Kate knew him real good. And I got to give her a hug, and I kissed her, and I said, I love you, Kate. Don't make yourself be a stranger again. I'm glad I got to hug her because I never got to see Kate again ever after that. Then gradually, Amanda, Josh came in. I said, what are y'all doing here? She said, we're going to go to the Surf and Turf Lodge. We're going to eat dinner with his family. Then we're going to the lake and put the pontoon boat in for the summer. I said, Daddy, I'll call you whenever I get home. So everything went well. And that, whenever they come out at 930, I was walking. And... Roger was walking out, and I remember he, he always looked me in the eye, always, and says, Morning, Tommy, how you doing? But that morning he kept his head down, just walked on. Said, Morning, Tommy. He never looked at me in the eye, and as many hearing as it all I've came since then, that man never looked me in the eye. He knew, to me, he knew what he was going to do that day. He knew it to me, but I'm just. That's just in my feeling. He knew it. If my daughter had been afraid of him at any time in her life, she would have told me. My daughter told me everything. I knew everything about everybody in that family. But my daughter was mature and grown up enough that she would tell me everything. Amanda, you need me to help you there? 
No, Daddy, I can handle it myself. Well, if you ever need anything, you just let me know. But she was such independent. She handled her own problems. She was that good of a woman. But uh, uh, whenever I got home from church that, that day, Kathy had sold her diaper and I was changing her diaper. Phone rang. Now, before I left the church, I was going to have an ablation done my, my May the 23rd. And Carrie, she was there. And I said, Carrie, I've got to have a ablation. Man, it's going to take me that day. And y'all put, a, put me on the prayer list. And she said she would. So I got Kathy and we went home and phone rang. And by the time I got her doctor changed, she, it didn't nobody answer. I hadn't answered. It rang again, and I picked it up. And it was Jonathan Pugh, who was associate pastor at the church. And he said, um, "Tommy, you at home?" I said, "Yes, this is my home phone." He said, "I need to come talk to you." I hung out. I said, "That's odd." I just told Carrie and him to pray for me. They didn't have to do nothing else. When he walked in the door, walked through the door, he walked in. He said, "Tommy, they've been a bad wreck." Man, it looks bad for a man. I said, Jonathan, you tell me right now if she's dead. Don't you BS me or nothing. You tell me the truth if she's dead. He said, no, she's in bad shape. I said, what about the kids? He said, Kendall had a cup, but Caleb's going to be here. I hate. And I got Kathy. I didn't even have time to get diapers, nothing. And she always had diapers. She went through a ton of diapers. But I didn't get none. And usually... Whenever I go off, I give her baby food or food that's already ground up. I put back in jars. Whenever we got to the emergency room, uh, some friends that used to go to the church, Steve and Holly Williams and Courtney Williams, were standing outside the emergency room. And Courtney's sister, Lauren, Amanda, had got her a job at the ER, at the hospital for her. Steve, I loved him to death, but they had left Venture then, and they 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 beat a lot of people there. And whenever I, I come out, they said Amanda just left on the first helicopter. Kendall was on the helipad. She was on the helipad with Austin. Said she was next. They took us to hospital. Whenever I got there, I looked up. Darn, Kendall just getting here. My daughter wasn't the first one. My daughter was the second one. And that was her helicopter coming in right then. But we went inside and a, a woman had... Evidently they knew a lot of people was coming and all. And they had it... A woman already had it organized. They already had a room set up and all. Whatever we went in. I remember Taylor saying, Don't hate my daddy. And I didn't know what it was then. I didn't know what it was, but when I found out, I, did, I wouldn't hate him. I despised the SOB. That's what I would have said, but I didn't know till later. I didn't know. But everything was organized, and the doctor, that spokes lady, come in. She said, there'll be an update as soon as possible from the doctor whenever he comes down. And I'm not exactly sure what time, what it was, because Lauren, she started, she put Kathy in a wheelchair and she watched her for me in case I had to go anywhere. Had doctor come down and first the girl, person he talked about, first patient, Kendall, he said, she got staples in her head and she seems to be okay, but they wasn't sure if it's going to keep her overnight or not. The elderly woman, she's, she's broke up pretty bad, real bad, but it's going to take time, but they think she's going to be okay. <sighs> As for the last one they brought in, she had a she had two cardiac arrests coming over, and they wasn't nothing they could do for her. And it eat me so bad that I was glad... Steve and Holly and Courtney was there, but I wish they hadn't have been. I could have went in and been with my daughter, and she was alone when she died, Your Honor. She she was alone. I asked the doctor, I said, is it okay if I could 
through my daughter's body. And he said, yes, but it'll take time. And gradually they worked us in. And I remember Austin walked in with me too. And as soon as I got in, as soon as I got in, I'll never forget her laying there. And I still have this nightmare to the day. They had her laying there. Her eyes taped close. Three tubes sticking out of her. Her body swollen where they pump so many fluids in her trying to sleep. And all they would let me do was he ran over her like a dog and they only let me do his pat her hand like a dog because she was still listed as evidence. <laughs> I, I wish I hadn't looked at her in a way, but I'm glad I did because but I still had that nightmare. I, I hadn't slept in two and a half days. I keep having that nightmare. I can see her laying there on that gurney in my state clothes. Them three tubes sticking out. Me patting her hand. The doctor, the spokeswoman said, they probably would keep Kendall overnight for observation. And it, it, it hit me then. I said... I've got her mother here. I ain't even got diapers. The hospital couldn't even hardly... I think they furnished one diaper. I'm not sure. Uh, Lauren was checking on that, but... Carrie Austin's the pastor's wife, she ended up staying with uh, Kendall that night. But they wanted me to tell Kendall before I left that her mother was dead. Austin went in there with me too. Kendall saw me and we walked in one another room there and they took us in when the counselor for the kids was there and she told me, be blunt, don't say her mother passed away. Tell her her mother is dead. She was sitting on bed. She raised up and I sat down beside her. I said, Kendall... Said. You know, whenever that car comes through that window, you said that Kendall, you know, that car is so strong, her, the metal is so strong, and he hit her so fast, baby. I said, they tried, they tried so hard to save your mommy. They tried so hard, Kendall. But I looked her right in the eye and said, Kendall, your mommy's dead. She cried. She, I just held her. I just held her. You just got to imagine what it's like. Tell that kid that her mother's dead. And uh, thank you. they wanted me to stay all night, but Carrie did. Then the next morning, I went. They wanted me to check Kendall out. She was going to come out, but I went to the waiting room. And there I was ch- checking on Josh. Josh was in a coma. And they had him, I think they might have induced the coma on him, but they had him out so he wouldn't wake up. Kendall was going to come in about dinner time that day, but they wanted me to tell Caleb. Sissy said she wanted to be there. Sissy would be being Kendall. And we waited. And whenever Kendall came in, I said, you want to say something to him? You tell him, Papa. And we was in a little square, probably probably six chairs in there. And Rita, Josh's mom, was had him on lap, but the little boy knowed something was up. I said, Caleb, when Sissy walked in, I said, come here, Caleb, sit on my lap. And whenever he sat on my lap, I said, buddy, what I'm going to tell you is going to hurt you. 
I said, buddy, it's going to hurt the heck out of you. And Papa don't want to hurt you. Papa never hurt you in his life. I said, I told him the same thing. I told Ken, I said, Ken, look. Do you know when that car hits my mommy? I said, it hurt her so bad, baby. They couldn't hurt. They couldn't help her. Caleb, I don't want to hurt you. I don't want to hurt you. Caleb, your mommy's dead. I've never heard a child scream like that ever. Even after I come back with him, there's an officer pilking them with the county police. It's, God, I never want to hear a kid scream like that again ever. And I picked him up straight up on my shoulder, and I knew Josh was in a in a coma. I said, "Scream, buddy! Cry your little lies out, buddy! Scream! I'll cry with you and scream too." I said, "But when we get to this room, I said, Daddy's got boo boos you ain't never seen before." I said, "Daddy, it's hurt for so bad. You insist he's got to be strong for him. I didn't want Josh to die for me to die too. God." Whenever I got to the I see you had to pick the phone up and say I said self and whenever we walked in, he quit crying and we took him out I took him in that first room and I had his eyes dry and all that and whenever we went in, Josh was laying there just in that coma. He was tore out the crap. I mean, he was tore out the crap. Caleb walked. I said, stand right there. And Sissy stood on this side of him. Pat his hand. Touch him. Touch him. I said, y'all here for daddy. Y'all going to be strong for daddy. Amanda would have been so proud of those kids. They knew they needed their daddy after losing her mama. Next day, we went to the waiting room and Josh was in a car and they were supposed to open him up for men. The doctor told it was me, Rita, and Josh's stepdad, Scott. Whenever we went up, the doctor had told them to make sure I told him just what he asked and not what he what I want to say. And he woke up and I, he just said, I can't remember if he said how, where, where am I or what, but how are the kids? Kendall had a bad head injury and Caleb's okay. Kendall's okay too, Josh. What about Diane? Diane's tore up, Josh. Diane's tore up real bad. What about Amanda? Amanda's dead. His monitor, his heart rate and pulse, which, I mean, who did it? I said, your daddy, he said, that pathetic coward. And his heart rate, I mean, I had to shut. Scott, I remember Scott telling me he thought he was going to have to slam me so I wouldn't say nothing else. That's, that's how bad he he got so mad. He, he, you, he was about to have a heart attack laying there. And then I walked out from it. And uh, Kathy's mom Now the uh, after we made arrangements and all, I let him hold up Amanda's body until Josh would be able to attend her funeral. And whenever Kathy and me already had a, our cemetery plotted, Armstrong Cemetery in Belmont, we'd had it since probably '89, and I wanted them to bury. Amanda beside me, Kathy, but it was always so many people. I asked David, I said, can we move in ours and move it beside Amanda? At first they said they had a cemetery up here in, uh, and, and wanted me be buried, wanted to bury her there. They said it's free. I said, is he going to be there? Yes. I don't want my daughter ever buried with this man, ever, ever. We went to the cemetery and David was going to pick a pretty place out up on a hill, but Josh was in a wheelchair chair and I said, David, just put us beside the road. And I said, it don't matter. We're not, they're not going to be in there anyway when we die. That way Josh can come out to her, uh, the hers, I mean, uh, the limousine and they can just take him straight and it made it so much easier. But 
man that's buried at her mama's feet right now. And the hospital loved that girl so much that they, they, they made a $50,000 scholarship in her honor every May the 20th. They loved that girl. That girl was that hospital. She loved her job. She didn't ask to be killed. Neither one of them did. It, it's unreal. Usually Gast- Gastonia has an adopt a street. Adopt a uh, highway. They let me adopt a street. Court Drive, it's the one the hospital's on. Probably a mile long. And a lot of people ask me, and Scotty, in memory of Amanda George's self. A lot of times we'll have ribbons, doves, whatever underneath it. And a lot of people ask me, let me go take to clean it up. That's only why I get the honor of my daughter picking up trash. Picking up trash. And in memories. But every memory of her and her mom was awesome. And I'll go walk it by myself a lot of times because that's my free time to talk to my daughter. Takes about an hour, hour and a half to go up and an hour, hour and a half to come down. And that that's where I get to talk to my daughter at. That's the only time I get to talk to my daughter. Ma'am, that's that's my daughter. That's the only thing I get to look at and remember my daughter. She was beautiful. And that smile she's got, that smile stayed with you forever. And he took it away from her. He took it away from her. Then losing her at the grocery store, I mean, losing Amanda... If I would have died first, I would have never have known about this girl. I walked in the grocery store one day and the woman said, You're Amanda's that Tommy? I said, Yes, ma'am. Amanda saved my baby. She saved my baby. I'd have never known it. Amanda never bragged about it. After she told me about that baby story, Amanda never said another thing. Ever. Ever. And her and Daddy were so close and we could talk and but that girl would keep her job herself. She'd go save somebody's life and go on and move on with her job. I was in Walmart one day and the, the cashier said, you're the girl, you're the guy that lost the daughter, ain't you? I said, yeah. She saved my grandpa. She saved my grandpa. I'd have liked to know how many lives she'd have got to save. He got to pray people in right and left about all his life. 80s, 90s, 2000, 2020s. That was awesome. That man was a good man. He, He was a real good man. He was an awesome man. But that was pre to May the 20th, 2018. He threw all that away the day he murdered my daughter and Kate. He threw that away. My wife would sit at the table whenever I feed her. I kept Amanda's obituary on that table. With that disease she had, she could remember, but she couldn't communicate. That was my hardest part. She, trying to move that mouth at me, trying to understand what she was saying. But she'd pick out, she'd pick out a bitch where hold that picture to her chest, give no little kiss, and hit back down. I still leave that picture there, hoping my wife was still there. My wife would have been dead in July, but she knew I lost that little girl when she was my kid too now. Kathy held on for so long trying to be this girl that I lost. <laughs> she held on to September the 7th, 2018, three and a half months after her uh, daughter was murdered. I bet you should have went in July. Whenever they came and I put the bed in, put the bed in the living room and that was 2 o'clock that Thursday. Nurses, uh, Nurse Nina was going to stay there. And Carrie Austin's wife was going to stay Friday night to help me watch her. But as soon as we laid her down, 
by four o'clock, you could see them little legs already turning colors. Her blood was already shutting down. That girl, my lady, at two o'clock, Kindle six that Friday morning. She left. She was ready to go. She left after sixteen hours. That little that little girl of mine. It's like I've lost two kids and a wife in three and a half months. And then with this COVID and all, it's it's been a hellish three years. And but it's been a blessing that it took this long, I guess, Your Honor, because. I've learned what a lot of people has been like. Josh told me about six months after it started, he said, people's watching, see how we do take this. I said, Josh, it's okay. I said, it don't matter. And I said, I probably know who told you that, but that man can't save me. You can't save me. They can't save me. Only the Lord upstairs can save me. I was 52 whenever I got saved. My wife always tried to get me, get me saved, but I never would. The Lord could have let her lead me, but she knew she was going to wait on me. He let her keep her mind. And once she saw me get saved and baptized, he let me go. But Kathy was a youth director at Flint Rose Baptist Church. And when she passed away, there were so many people that even said how how much that woman touched their, her life. He, there's a deputy sheriff. His name's Brian he fell in the shower and he has to take disability now. I can't remember Brian's last name, but Brian Goodson. Yeah, Brian Goodson. And he come up to me, he said, I'm going to tell you this, that's the best woman that ever I ever had. She always kept Amanda in church. and Amanda was a, a kid's on at church. It was... I, uh, kindergarten through fifth grade and whenever uh, Drew and his wife they adopted a child overseas and they vetted me and background check me and I went and watched and the first day my daughter was on that stage and had them kids damn that's my daughter <laughs> I mean her mom gave her the perfect heart she desired. And, and I could see her mother in her there right then. And uh, right now the only peace I got is knowing that my two girls are together. Don't nobody want to wish their daughter dies before them. Nobody does. But if anybody deserved each other, them do. But I wanted to swap places with my daughter so bad. But it ain't going to happen. As for this guy, I'm a Christian, I forgive him, but I will never, ever forget him. I'll never forget this man. I hold no hate or animosity, but there's something I just can't accept here. He destroyed so many people's lives. He destroyed so many. All those nurses that took care of all those EMTs, nurses, and paramedics that once they realized they was working on Amanda, Josh, and Kate. Then even after three years during the testimony, they still had tears from losing those kids, that Kate and Amanda. And it's amazing them those two still touch those people's hearts. And all the employees that worked at the sheriff sheriff's office that was Kate's co-workers. And if I ain't mistaken, they had to move her shift that Sunday night to another week. Had to cancel it for a week, knowing what they'd have probably done. Yeah. 
and all those surf and turf employees molesting her kids. Having a look at the first hand, those kids saw more blood, horror, chaos in two hours than we see in our lifetime. Kids scarred. Kendall told me that day that Poppy said he had a headache. Told her he was going had a headache. He was going outside get a goodie powder. But she remembers him staring at her when he came through that building. Caleb, he remembers his mama underneath that vehicle that day. All these people talk a good talk about how good a man Roger was, but in the 80s, and all the good deeds he's been done, we all watched more than 10 people parade through here vouching for his character, but I wish one of them would have done an involuntary commitment on him. When I even noticed the first glance that my wife was ill, I sacrificed everything I had in this world to care and love for her. I'd never want her to do anybody's life like that, ever. He may have been a good man on... But on May 20th, 2018, that changed. He made a choice to leave that restaurant. He got in that car and he drove around that parking lot and he sat up at the top. He could have easily gotten his car and drove away. He could have driven himself off a cliff. He could have left for a day and leave and come back. He could have driven to another state and started a new life, anything of that. But that man, he stomped that gas. And it was his two hands that steered through that window. And it was his hands that took that man, that, that man, he took my grandson and my granddaughter's mama they won't never ever get another mother ever never and two days after it Josh thought it was funny but I said Josh I give you my blessing find those kids somebody to love them like Amanda did little Caleb he was mama's mama's girl mama's boy Caleb loved hugs <clears throat> there's a woman back there with him right now her name's Amy She gives Caleb those hugs. She's there for Kendall. All I ask you, honey, don't. That doctor. He said he could not guarantee that this man would ever do it again. Don't ever let him destroy any more lives. If he if he does, those grandkids were are, are was twelve and eight. Let them be old enough so they never had to worry about him destroying their lives or killing them again. Let them be old enough to where they can look after their self or they don't ever have to worry about him driving your honor. I hope the sounds, I don't know if he's got a conscience or not. He's got a, he, to me, listen to testimony, he, he acts like he doesn't, but my nightmare is Amanda's two patches on those eyes and those three tubes and me patting her hand. I hope this man's nightmare. He hear those windows shattering, those walls caving in, that furniture and being shoved and busting out the back of that wall.
don't ever have it, don't ever let him have another chance to destroy another life. That's all I have, Your Honor. Thank you, sir.